All right, what's up, everybody? Chinu Francis Wafili, as you introduced. Um, and we're going to be talking about Percy, which is, as stated, a library for building isomorphic web apps in Rust. Um, a quick warning for the beginning. A lot of this stuff is experimental. Um, there are areas where it works pretty nicely, other areas where it's like a little verbose, a little inefficient, still working on that. Um, but hopefully the sort of direction is somewhat interesting. And so we talked about a few things. One, what is Percy today? Um, how are we targeting Wasm? What does it look like? How does it feel? And since this is a Rust conference, and I'm assuming a lot of you care about Rust and Rust details, we'll talk about it with more of a technical focus versus sort of a bird's eye view. Um, and so the approach that I was thinking of was I took a bunch of screenshots of a bunch of different um, code that compiles to WebAssembly, and we'll sort of just talk through how that works. Um, and you'll hopefully walk away with a solid understanding of how and why things work the way that they do, um, and then sort of the future that will hopefully come from that. And then at the end, uh, time permitting, we'll maybe take a couple minutes to look at a quick demo and make a special surprise. OK, so before we talk about Percy, uh, I have to shout out a couple of crates, which Alex is here somewhere. Um, there you are. Uh, these do almost all the work, and then I just kind of use them. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's Wasm BindGen and WebSys, which is in the same cargo workspace. Um, and I won't try and explain all the technical details, because the person that wrote it is actually here. But in short, uh, these help you generate a lot of the bindings that allow your Rust code to talk with native browser APIs. Um, today, WebAssembly code doesn't have any access to things like um, the DOM directly. You have to talk to JavaScript, who then talks to your host and does everything for you. Uh, in the future, that will change. And Wasm BindGen is built for that future. Um, so we're sort of headed in the right direction over time. Not quite there yet. Um, and this is Percy. Um, I wanted to call out this piece right here, which is that it's mostly Rust. And that's sort of the theme, so yay. And what was the motivation um, before we dive into the technical details? So I'm working on a Rust plus WebAssembly WebGL game. Um, so while doing that, I realized, wow, I love Rust, and I want to use this for everything. Um, and so I needed something to build websites with. There was another library out there that I found that looked really interesting, but it didn't have server-side rendering. Um, a lot of people here probably aren't familiar with the web, because a lot of you write C++. I don't know how, but I'm learning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so that just means that on a search engine, if you're searching for a website, um, Google needs to index it, so it needs to know what's on it. And nowadays, it can kind of do a good job of indexing things that aren't rendered on the server. But your best bet is to have the server send down the content. The um, crawler sees that, can index it just fine. And so we needed a library that can render on both your server and on the client in the browser. So Percy was born. Um, and this was the real motivation. That's one user us. <laughs> so um, this is just a screenshot of something I'm working on now using Percy. Uh, it's the website for my game, so just HTML, CSS generated from Rust. Um, and it's powered by sort of real-world development where, um, get my timer up, work on something, sort of run into issues, fix them as we go, right? Pretty simple. So I think we're going to get to code soon. Cool. Um, so let's start diving into sort of the pieces that power this, right? Uh, so if you've written HTML before, it's basically similar to, similar to XML. Um, you define some node, and then this node can have child nodes. And then <clears throat> based on the attributes, properties, whatever you want to call them, you specify. The browser will interpret this into um, graphics that it eventually renders. Um, and so when writing web applications in Rust, uh, while well, you could sort of just hand code the data structures that end up leading to these um, HTML strings, you probably don't want to. And so you need a macro to do that, right? So this is one of the first key pieces of Percy. It's the HTML macro. So you can see we specify a div with an ID property, a class property. And then inside of that div, there's a span, which has a text node that says, hey, with a little smiley face, and a button, which has an on-click handler, which is pulling some or setting some cell with some value. Um, sort of all the way down. And so you write HTML. Obviously, it doesn't look exactly like you would if you were, say, in a regular HTML file. There's these weird commas um, everywhere, which I will need to talk to more procedural macro experts to see if I can figure out a way to get rid of those. But for now, they're there. 
Um, but it, it's mostly similar, and you sort of pay a little trade-off with some slight unfamiliarity, but on the good side, you get all the type safety, and it's really hard to write things incorrectly. Um, and at the bottom, we'll talk about this a bit later, you're seeing that we're rendering toString because um, our HTML here is just a regular struct that implements display so you can render it to a string. And that will power server-side rendering, which we will get to. Um, so we saw that HTML, right? But what does that create? So at the end of the day, that ends up being a macro that generates a virtual node. And so a virtual node is a tag. So a div, span, bold, um, it's properties, so ID, class, um, data, hyphen, foo, whatever sort of attributes you want, events, on click, on mouse over, and then children. So a child is another virtual node, and you know, turtles all the way down. And then optionally, it can be a text node. So as you saw before, there was that hey. Um, that's a text node, which in the browser web world is different from an element. You have to handle it kind of weirdly, but um, as long as you sort of know the APIs, you can make it all work together. Um, so a virtual node can represent either text or a regular element. And sort of based on what's set here, we'll know how to eventually turn this into a real DOM element, element which we'll get to. Um, and as the title says, this is sort of the oomph behind everything. And so your HTML generates this. Uh, the diffing and patching virtual DOM algorithms use this to then update the DOM. Um, and everything's really built around the sort of virtual node concept. And again, the nice part here is it's just some data, um, and then we have methods later to use that data to render in the browser, uh, which we'll get to. So the first piece of it is the diffing algorithm. So if any of you are familiar with React, which kind of popularized this concept, um, you will have two different virtual trees. So on the right, there's you know, a bunch of test cases, maybe a div and a span on top. And then when we're diffing those, what we generate as our diff is a vector of patches that will get applied to a real DOM element. Um, for something simple like this, there's only one patch, which is a replace patch. And so that's saying we're going to replace the first node um, with a span. Um, and what isn't shown here is the test that sort of makes sure this works, but uh, hopefully you can assume that it does. And the second one, we're replacing the second, or the second node, which is index one, so a bold, the B slash B, with a strong, right? And so on, there's replaces. You can append children, you see it at the bottom. And so how it works, and this might be familiar to you if you've written other maybe JavaScript front end libraries, is in your application code, in your application crate, you are generating these virtual nodes. You then diff two of them, um, as you can sort of see here, and then you'll get these patches, and then later on in the browser, You'll go to your real DOM element using Wasm bind gen and say, OK, I want to apply this patch. I want to replace this node. I want to set this attribute. And then your browser is updated, um, which you'll see a visual of in the demo, hopefully. And so that's the diffing piece. The patch piece is, again, just powered by regular old Rust structs, right? You can append children. So you have a DOM node, and then you append other um, elements to it. You can truncate children. So you have a DOM node with some children. And let's say that your new DOM state no longer has those children, um, there would be a truncate patch. There's a replace patch where maybe a div becomes a span. So you would replace that node. And then there's adding, removing attributes, and setting text. And so effectively, every single thing that ever changes in your DOM can be represented in these um, different mutations. And you just have a vector of them and you apply them. Um, as we sort of go farther along and start to optimize things, the underlying implementations of how we handle these patches will probably change or um, be cached in certain ways, et cetera. But effectively, all changes to the DOM look something like this. Um, <clears throat> so as you can imagine, um, when you're dealing with something so new as um, compiling Rust to WebAssembly, you can bang your head for a while. Things might not work as you expect. And it's kind of very important that you have high test coverage. So another thing that I didn't write, but I get to talk about, is Wasm bind gen test, where um, due to some sorcery that I don't fully yet understand, and again, I don't need to because Alex is here, um, <laughs> you can use Gre Gecko driver, Chrome driver, Safari driver, compile to WebAssembly, um, run that code inside of one of these browsers, and then you effectively have a Rust test harness running. Um, and so, 
probably should have gotten a screenshot of output, but I can run all of these tests. They run in the browser. I'm diffing and patching real DOM nodes. And then I can assert to make sure, as we're doing kind of on the left um, here, that I get some node in the DOM that matches what I tried to patch. Um, and so it's not like you know theoretical, this works in memory, and I'm hoping it works in the browser. We can actually test against the browser uh, using the awesome tooling that exists. Um, unit testing is another focus where uh, <laughs> one thing that I quickly found is waiting a few seconds for your code to recompile and then refreshing your browser is incredibly frustrating uh, and makes you want to flip your laptop over. And so that quickly inspired testing um, tooling. And so um, what's kind of highlighted here is, again, since all of your HTML, your entire web application is just a bunch of virtual nodes that have virtual node children, um, you can define methods that let you access different virtual nodes. And so here, um, we're like rendering some view. We're looking at the children. We're asserting that there is a child um, at index 0 with certain text. Um, and sort of making sure that all the rendering works. And that would work for any component that you're working on. Um, and so because it's all, again, just data behind it, you can implement whatever method you want and test against whatever you want. So testing actually ends up being very easy, and you don't have to refresh the browser and um, get upset. So one other interesting piece of Percy that is getting worked on a bit now is CSS and Rust. Um, so here's a highlight of it before we sort of talk about the underlying implementation details, which um, are probably a bit more interesting. So at the top here is like a quick screenshot from some like very simple web app that we'll look at towards the end. Um, and as you can see, there's this beautiful gradient, which I did not take from Yahoo, and I did not just change the colors. <laughs> and at the bottom, here's sort of the code that powers it, right? So there's this CSS macro that <clears throat> has um, this align items. You know, The background has a linear gradient. And then, um, what we'll sort of do with that is there's a procedural macro that runs um, at compile time. And we take that CSS, we'll grab it out. There's a global counter that says, how many of these CS blocks, CSS blocks have we seen? So this is the first one, right? So we'll generate a class called CSS0. Um, as you can kind of see in the example on the right at the bottom. Uh, the test cases. So there's a class called CSS RS0, and that will then have all the CSS that you defined. Then we'll get CSS RS1, that will have CSS, and we'll add sort of all this into one large growing string. We'll write that to a file that you specify with a uh, environment variable called output CSS. And so at compile time, a procedural macro grabs all of your CSS calls, generates a bunch of classes, and writes them to a file. And so then when you're running your application, you are only sending down, I guess, class names that your um, virtual nodes are using. And the CSS will obviously have the same class of names, and it works. And so you can write your CSS right next to your Rust views, um, which is especially useful for people who want to sort of publish things to the web, but you don't want to learn a bunch of stuff like Less or Sass or all of these um, tools that compile down to CSS. You can just kind of write a little CSS block right next to what is using it, and it works. Um, I'm using this in production right now, and it feels very nice. The reason that I know that I like it is when I start from scratch, I still go in this direction versus sort of walking towards something that I'm more used to. So uh, I'm going to keep exploring that. And this is just another example of it where um, you have your navbar CSS here, which will eventually just get turned into a static string CSS RS0 that we looked at before. And then here, you have a div with a class. Um, that has that same static string as the class, and you know the macro will parse that into the um, class property in the virtual node. And so then when you render this HTML in the browser, um, you end up with a div with the right class, and then you're sending down that CSS, and it sort of hooks up together. So that should be CSS. Um, and so one other sort of piece that powers the puzzle that we'll look at the, at the end is the router. Um, so Actually, for this piece, there are a lot of routers that are really interesting that are being worked on now, but they're mostly for backend applications. Um, like I know Rocket has one, and sort of other backend frameworks use routers. The not necessarily issue, but difference is that front end routing is largely similar, but also has very different concerns. Like there's no authorization, 
there's authorization. But there aren't any headers. Um, you're not dealing with sort of a request response cycle in that way. And so you need something that, yes, matches paths against incoming paths, but um, has whole different guards against it. And so um, there is definitely a lot of room to uh, make more progress on the routing side. What we do have now so far is sort of a type safe router um, struct and a route struct where I might specify slash users slash ID, as you can kind of see on the right, um, right in the middle. And so um, we'll see that, right? And at the top, our struct has, our view has an ID of a U32. And so we won't match a route that's slash user slash foo um, near the bottom because foo is obviously not a U32. Um, but we would match slash user slash five because that is. And so the nice part there is if maybe some of you do web development and use JavaScript, you find yourself repeatedly going through a bunch of if statement hurdles to make sure that you're matching against the sort of right input that you want and handling all the other stuff. Whereas due to Rust's type safety, you can just completely trust that you will never have to handle anything that should not be there. Um, not a security expert, don't trust me there. But <laughs> You will usually not have to handle anything that should not be there um, unless there's some weird you know, edge case where someone's giving you a really big number or something. Um, and then so that sort of looks like this, where you have a router which has a vector of routes, and then you would add routes to it by pushing them. Um, and then eventually you call a view method whenever you change. Uh, I don't want to talk too deeply into sort of the web, but in your browser URL, you have sort of the path that you're at. And you'll match that against your router, and you'll say, give me the view that's associated with that, um, which is an option against the box sort of trade object. You'll get back the view, you'll render that view, and then you'll display to the user what they should see. Um, and then sort of on the right side, there's the actual route, which is your route definition. So that might be like slash user slash ID. Um, the parameter types, so as we looked at before, ID might be a U32. Um, you might have a string for another parameter, et cetera. And then your view creator function, which takes in all the parameters that your view was provided, so an ID with an unsigned int and everything else, and then generates a, <coughs> um, a box view that you can then render. And a view is just a trait that Percy provides that has a render method, um, some other niceties. So um, that's a lot of the underlying pieces of it. Some of the longer term goals are to be able to use Rust and WebAssembly for web dev without using a lot of concepts. And so a lot of the sort of philosophy behind the tooling that Percy provides is not needing to learn a bunch of terms that we've made up. And so you kind of, there are, there are you know, industry web dev standards now, like a virtual DOM um, and diffing patching, and we try to sort of reuse those and not create new ones, um, which can lead to, um, not inventing like really interesting things, but that's kind of the point. I like when my stuff is boring. And so um, the goal here is to be sort of the underlying tooling that can power other um, frameworks that have these interesting ideas that might require a bit more of an investment if you want them, but if you don't, then you just use the underlying tooling or swap out other things, right? Um, another piece of it is to have this be heavily trait-based, and so one of the beauties of, of Rust that I found so far in my you know, short time using it is the trait system where, let's say the virtual node right now is its own struct, so you kind of can't really use a lot of what Percy offers unless you're using that virtual node. Um, but as we move that to instead be a trait, then someone can come and say, wait, this diff patch algorithm that you've implemented is terrible, I have a better one, and then you can just go and use that without having to rewrite any of your application because it implements the same virtual node trait um, that you're already using. Um, there's also the Percy book, which we've started writing using MDBook. Um, another shout out to Awesome Bindgen, because I just copied your Travis YML and uh, <laughs> got that working pretty quick. Um, and so one other piece before I think we dump into the, hey, the, the demo is contributing. Um, so if you're interested in doing more WebAssembly stuff, obviously I'll be here and we can sort of talk about how more of it works under the hood. Um, but the best way to sort of contribute is the world world driven development way, which is try and build something uh, for the web in Rust, open issues about the stumbling blocks that you run into, what's not fun, what didn't make sense, and then we'll sort of fix those one by one. And eventually, hopefully, um, there are a lot of options out there for you to build real web applications uh, with Rust. And demo time. 
Where's my please clap sign? Okay, so I have a really, really basic uh, web app that I threw together here, um, which you kind of saw in the screenshot, and we're going to add a piece to it in the few minutes we have, right? So I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, so very simple, there's that nav bar that we rendered. Um, well, can you zoom in from right here? Oh, yeah, how do I do that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm also working on a... Uh, PHP to Rust compiler. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, command what? I'm going to go command help search. <laughs> Just straight up disappeared. <laughs> oh, there we go. Sorry? What is that? Oh dear. View, okay. We've got some help from the audience. Uh -oh. oh, okay. Somebody's smart out there. Um, so that nav, so that nav bar that you saw, if I can type properly, <laughs> there we go. Yes, perfect. Um, so the nav bar that you saw sort of looks like this, where presentation mode's a little weird, but I'll get used to it. You have a nav bar struct, which has an active page and some reference to a store, which holds our state. And that's how you sort of get access to different state. Um, it implements view, which has a render function. And so we'll get the. Um, the nav bar item, um, which I'll go back to so you can actually see it, but we generate that by passing in the path for the uh, route that it will link to, which is slash contributors, the text for the nav bar item, which is contributors, um, some extra styling, which is in here, margin left auto, and then we will render our nav bar with our home button and our contributor button, and then if we go back into the browser, um, you see um, the contributors here, which is just that component that we rendered and embedded, and then the home which just links to Isomorph for web app. So if I click on this, um, as you saw, it said slash contributors, so it would go to like the contributors route, just, like pretend that looks beautiful. And then this would come back here. Um, and then another piece of it is, uh, man, you guys are good. There we go. So again, since you're in Rust, you have everything that you'd expect, right? So there's the state struct, um, which for something that's a nav bar and two buttons, obviously doesn't have a lot, but there's a click count, which is a reference counted cell. And we can render based on that click count. So if we go to the home page view, um, you can see here that we'll use the click count in our rendering. Um, and then if we increment the click count with this button, the click count will increment in the browser. And so one piece that we'll quickly add while there are a few minutes left is the special friend, which right now just increments the click count, but instead we'll make it show the special friend. So how we'll do that is we'll come back into here. I'll go to the correct project. Um, and first, we'll add a new message type. So this is just an enum. I've been calling it enum forever until I came here, and a lot of people looked at me crazy. So I guess it's called an enum. I was right? Yeah. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll add this. And I left a comment at the bottom in case I forgot. But we'll add this show special friend variant, right? And then we'll go to where we handle all of our message variants. And if you haven't written something like React before, or if you have, rather, this is kind of like state.dispatch, um, where you have messages and then you'll have handlers for them. So we'll go to our state here. And then somewhere in this blob, we handle messages, right? So there's this incoming message for showing a special friend. Um, and that'll call, I also threw this at the bottom in case I forgot. Um, so that'll set state.showSpecialFriend to true. 
So we're onto something. So now, <coughs> whenever we send a show special friend method, our state store will grab that and it'll say, what do we want to do? Okay, we want to set show special friend to true. Um, so now, if we go back to our view for the home page, um, here we have that show special friend button that we saw before, right? You see the text show special friend. It's sending a click message um, to our store, which wraps that state. Instead, we'll make it send a show special friend message. Um, and I will grab this so I don't have to think and talk, paste it here, delete this, hit a little of that, and then we are setting special friend to be a different component if it's true. So you'll see there on line 33, our special friend is just an empty div. This is starting to sound creepy. Um, <laughs> but if show special friend is true, um, so if it returns true, then we'll instead show some image, which I recognize how creepy this sounds at this moment. Um, and so now if we just compile this, and I didn't make any mistakes, um, Yeah, so the server actually takes a few seconds to compile now. Um, whoever was talking about Actix earlier, I'm using Actix Web, so let's talk. Um, <laughs> but it should be listening on port 78. 78. So let's, I don't know, make this 1,000. Refresh. Um, click a bunch of times and show our special friend. Cool. Um, so the last piece that we'll talk about really quickly uh, before I go is sort of a very high level overview of how this works. And again, if you want to understand it a bit further, uh, we can talk out there. But essentially, from top to bottom, <clears throat> oh man, yeah. like that mind in my in my head or that voice in my head. Yeah. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, so we have an Actix web server here, which um, will receive a request, and then it will return index.html, right? So what does that look like? Um, so that is here, where we have just some HTML file that it's reading from disk. And on line 11, it will insert HTML from the server. So it will render the application to a string on the back end, because of server-side rendering. It will inject it into this HTML file and then send that down. So right away, even if you had JavaScript and WebAssembly disabled, you'll see something. Um, then you'll see at the bottom on line 22, there's this um, bundle.js script, which, <clears throat> and also this sort of isomorphic client.js script, which effectively these two scripts run. Um, they'll initialize the WebAssembly, and so the client gets this index.html, and then it sort of starts running WebAssembly, and WebAssembly takes over from there, right? Um, the problem is, let's say that you're, as you saw with that sort of init thing that we did, right? We can say init 2000, the server will see that it'll send the page down with 2,000. Um, I will switch to the right project. And there we go. Um, so you see it, it looked at the query string. It got um, the init flag. It unwrapped it. And then somewhere over here-ish, it will create an application with that initial value, right? So then how does the client know what to do from there? How does it not just start from zero and then your page quickly flashes? And so that's where in index.html, there's the nice part of <clears throat> the initial state JSON. So on the server, we'll replace that initial state JSON with just a JSON string of the initial state. Um, you could also use any other serialization you want. I'm assuming you're using Surde, so you could you know, have like a binary encoded thing or something. Um, and then on the client side, since this is all Rust code running. We're also using Surde to deserialize that back into your state struct. And so all you do is just send down what you want initially. The client, when it first starts on the WebAssembly side, will see that, deserialize it, and then have the exact same state that your server started off with. And so that's how you're able to seamlessly pick up with the same state that your backend had, and you don't just see the number change from like 2,000 to zero. Um, and I will just show you where that happens, and then we're done. Yes, it is all on GitHub, um, and add some contributions, use it. There's a bunch of instructions on sort of how to get started. 
Um, and so the last piece is here where we'll <clears throat> pass in that initial state string that we read from the browser, create an application, um, add a subscriber so that anytime state changes, you can do something. In this case, we call some update method to update the DOM. Um, and then we return this client to the um, JS side, and then the JS just starts it, and you're done. And that should do it.